So good morning all. So in this lecture, we are going to discuss about the types of studies. So we discussed the concepts of tests. We discussed the concepts of estimation. So now in the next chapter, we'll discuss how do you conduct a research study. Specifically, we are going to talk about the types of studies that are conducted. Now, there are three types, generally two types of studies. One is called as a cohort study. The other is called as a cross-sectional study. So one is a cohort study. The other is a cross-sectional study. So in this topic, we'll discuss cohort studies. So I want to give credit to John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health so for providing this lecture material. So now let's continue. How do you design a cohort study? A cohort study relies on the fact that we are looking first at the exposure factor for the disease and then look at whether the exposure factor causes the disease. So again, I'm going to fact it again. So we want to look at the factor and then we're going to look at whether the factor is going to create a disease or not. So what do you do? So the first case is to identify the people who are exposed to the factor and not exposed to the factor. So again, the factor is any element that can cause the disease. So we call that an exposure factor. So in the next part, where what we do is we follow the patients who are exposed and not exposed. And we see the groups, whether they develop the disease or do not develop the disease. In the same way, people who are not exposed, whether they develop the disease or do not develop the disease. So this is an example of a cohort study. So for example, what do we do? So in this case, first thing we do is we calculate the total number of people exposed. For example, let's call that A plus B. And people who are totally not exposed, we call let's call them C plus D. Next, to follow the patients, what do we do next is we want to see people who develop the disease and people who do not develop the disease. So people who develop the disease is A and people who do not develop the disease is B in the factors of exposed. People who develop the disease is C in not exposed. People who do not develop the disease is D in exposed. Next, we talk about incidence of the disease. Incidence of disease of exposed number of people is the number of people who develop the disease divided by the total number of people exposed to the disease. Next is the incidence of disease in unexposed. So here we're going to talk about number of people who develop the disease over the total number of people that are not exposed. So this is the case what we see. So here the first thing is to identify the exposure factor and then follow to see whether they develop the disease. So this is the case of a cohort study. Next. What do we do next is at last we calculate and compare the values. So how do you, what do you calculate? So first thing we calculate is the incidence of disease in people who are exposed. For example, if we take a condition of coronary heart disease, and cigarettes and we want to see whether cigarettes can cause coronary heart disease now for the first thing we select the people who smoke cigarettes who do not smoke cigarettes we have two different samples and in the second group we check to follow them whether they develop coronary heart disease and who do not develop the coronary heart disease 
and then we calculate the incidence of the disease which is 84 people who can develop the disease who smoke cigarettes divided by total number of people who smoke cigarettes next people who do not smoke cigarettes and develop the disease divided by the total number of people who do not say smoke cigarettes now what we do now is after you do then you compare the two values and check which one is higher so the factor in which the incidence is higher then that factor can cause the disease that's the understanding in any study but as a statistician you cannot say based on the data that we have we cannot identify or we cannot say the conclusion completely so what we do now is we then undergo statistical analysis for these kinds of tables so these type these types of data are called categorical data so these types of categorical data are generally taken in consideration because we do not have we have two categories the two categories here are people who smoke cigarettes and do not smoke cigarettes and we want to see which category has the chance of developing the disease so we do hypothesis testing separately for this which we'll discuss in the next lecture but this is the idea behind a cohort study next what do we start in the design of a cohort study so we began with a defined population and we non randomized the sample of exposed people and non exposed people and we followed to see whether they develop the disease in both the cases and who people who cannot develop the disease in both cases and in the next case how do you do this process of how do you compare the experimental and observational study an experimental study is a randomized trial which means that we randomly allocate people to two groups group a and group b in a cohort study is an observational study where the population is not randomly allocated it's other than randomly allocated to group a and group b the reason here in a cohort study is because cohort study understands that there is a significant predetermined notion of what are we looking for we are looking for people who are exposed and people who are not exposed in a randomized trial we are not looking at that we randomly allocate people to two groups and we judge them based on the two group alignment next what are the types of cohort studies there are two types one is a prospective cohort study the other is a retrospective cohort study a prospective cohort study is what we call a concurrent cohort study or a longitudinal cohort study so here in a longitudinal cohort study so we take in the data initially so we look at the exposure factor initially and then we see the patients to see the following the disease so here we are looking at the future a simple sense a longitudinal study looks at the future a retrospective study the name itself says retrospective which means that we are looking at the past so in a prospective study we know the exposure factor and we are looking at whether the person develops the disease in the future we are looking for what are the future developments in a retrospective study we know the future develop disease we are looking at the past for the exposure factors for example let's say we have a patient let's call it patient a so he presents to you with a certain mild mild pneumonia and in this case with that mild pneumonia you when you take the case history you understood that the person has a history of smoking now the thought behind the process is that once you know there is a history of smoking what do you do is you follow up with the patient when you follow up with the patient you want to see how severe is the pneumonia if he does not stop smoking this is an example of longitudinal or prospective cohort studies
So this is an example of a longitudinal or a prospective cohort study. Now, let's take another example. Let's take a patient B. He comes in with severe pneumonia. And he presents to you and you notice that he has a history of smoking. During that history of smoking, you detected that this person has severe pneumonia. The idea behind this is that you're looking for judging all the factors. You're looking for all the factors in his lifestyle. that can affect his lungs and you're focusing on each factor and judging whether it could have been the cause. So that is an example of a retrospective or retrospective cohort study. So when you follow the patient, we talk about longitudinal study in the future. When you have the patient with a severe problem, then you're gonna look back at the factors and then we decide whether the patient has a certain factor that you could pinpoint to that, is, that has caused the disease. So this is an example of a retrospective cohort study. Now, let's take an example. What do you do in a retrospective study, prospective study? We have a defined population and we take the number of people who are exposed or not exposed to the factor and we wanna see whether they develop the disease or not in the factor. Best example of a prospective study would be to see, let's say for example, if you take the Chernobyl nuclear incident. In the Chernobyl nuclear incidents, you are looking at two sets of people who are exposed to nuclear radiation. and people who are not exposed to nuclear radiation. And in the people who are exposed to nuclear radiation, you're looking at a case of people who develop cancer and who do not develop cancer. In the same way, people who are not exposed to clinical radiation, we want to see people who develop cancer, people who do not develop cancer. So this is an example of a longitudinal or a prospective cohort study. This is an example of a longitudinal cohort study. Your final understanding is that if you have too many people who are exposed and develop cancer, so if this is a large population, then you can pinpoint to the factor that this incident was the factor that caused this disease. So this is an example of understanding how cohort studies can be helpful in determining whether a particular factor can cause a disease. Whether a particular factor can cause a disease. Now, in terms of a retrospective study. In a retrospective study, you have people who have already developed the disease and you're looking whether they have been exposed to a certain factor or they have not exposed to a certain factor. 
and then we define the target population on which we want to judge. So, for example, let's say you have a case of people who develop lung cancer and people who do not develop lung cancer. In this case, you're looking at two groups again, people in which people who develop lung cancer, we want to see whether they have been exposed to a certain factor. Let's cause that exposure, smoking. So whether people smoke or people who do not smoke. In people who do not develop lung cancer, we want to see people who smoke and people who do not smoke. And then we decide on the understanding that once we have the factors that we determine, then we go back to the random so randomization of the population. So then we define the population. Understand that this is a non-randomized process in a cohort study because we have a predetermined understanding or a predetermined notion of what we are looking for. So this is an example of a retrospective study. What is the differentiate, differentiate between, how do you differentiate between prospective and retrospective? In a prospective cohort study, the investigator starts the study, identifies the population and the exposure status, and then he follows them for the development of the disease. And it takes a relatively long time to complete the study because you have to make sure that you maintain until as long as the length of the study continues, you have to be there. In a retrospective study, the investigator uses existing data that they have collected in the past to identify the population and the exposure status, and then determine and present the, at the present for the status of the disease. So the plus point of a retrospective study is that investigator spends relatively short time because he has assembled the study population and he also has determined the disease status at the present time. So that's the reason why retrospective cohort studies are simple and faster to do. How do you combine prospective and retrospective studies? So investigators use existing data that they collect and then identify the population and the exposure status and then they follow them into the future. This is an example of combining both prospective and retrospective studies. So here also investigators spends a relatively short time to assemble the study population from the past data, but he will spend additional time following them into the future for the development of the disease. So this is an example of where you can combine both prospective and retrospective cohort studies. So this type of uh, example is Framingham study is one of the examples of prospective cohort studies. So from an example, again, we are looking at exposed, not exposed, disease, no disease, disease, no disease. So what does the Framingham study's main objective? So they wanted to study the impact of several factors on incidence of cardiovascular disease. So they are looking at three main factors. One of them is blood pressure, smoking, body weight, diabetes, and exercise, etc. The multiple outcomes that they were expecting was one was coronary heart disease, stroke, congestive heart failure, and peripheral arterial disease. So they were looking at the incidence of cardiovascular diseases to, due to a certain factor. So in this case, what they were looking at. So Framingham study as a cohort study. So the study started with a defined population. So the investigators from the USPHS and NHLBI started by identifying a new population and did not use existing data to identify the population and the exposure groups. So there were several hypotheses to be tested. So what they did is they have different exposures and different outcomes. So for each exposure, the investigator identified the exposed and the not exposed groups. And the same way for each exposure, the patient, the participants were followed for the development of the disease. So they, they tested different exposures as well as different diseases. Now, this was the study that finally they concluded. One, they took a random sample of 3,074 men and 3,433 women 
with a total of 6,507 random samples. Now, in that, there were about 4,500, about 4,500 respondents and 4,740 volunteers. The respondents that were free of cardiovascular heart disease in total were about 4,400. Volunteers that were free of heart disease was 734. And the total number of people that were free of coronary heart disease was 5,127. Now, how do you follow up with the participants? So the risk factors and the development of the cardiovascular events, they were evaluated every two years by medical history, medical record review, and physical examination. So all the diagnoses were verified without knowledge of the risk factors by the Framingham examiners who reviewed medical records and death certificates. So what they found is that approximately 3% of the subjects were lost to follow up for mortality due to the first 45 years of the study, during the first 45 years of the study. Now, in 1948, they started the study. In 1960, they found that cigarette smoking is a main factor that increases the risk of the cardiac heart disease. And in 1961, they found that cholesterol, blood pressure, and ECG abnormalities were found to increase the risk of heart disease. In 1965, the first study that reported on stroke. So in 1967, they found that physical activity reduced the risk of heart disease and obesity to increase the risk. In 1970, they found that high blood pressure was as a factor of the increased heart disease. In 1974, they found that diabetes is associated with cardiovascular heart disease. This was one of the male milestones in the disease because this disease led to the entire field of cardiovascular pathology. And it also led more to the, so the public health development, especially to cardiovascular diseases. So that's why I put an example. I put a small link at the bottom. So I'll be giving you the slide as well. So if you click on the slide, you will go to the study and it will show you the timeline as well. So this is the book that uh, was written. So a change of heart that how the people of Framingham, Massachusetts had unraveled the mysteries of the cardiovascular disease. So it's an interesting book. You can go through it if you want. I'll provide uh, a link for the book so that if you want to study it, it can help you in studying. And it can also help you in understanding how so it can help you in understanding how public health can help in understanding chronic diseases. Diseases and it can help lead better life. It can help you lead a better life. So that is the example for Framingham study. So one of the main group they found is that women were at a higher rate of having heart disease than men. And they found that annual increase, annual incidence of coronary heart disease was much higher in men in comparison to women. And uh, when their weight was higher, when their weight was higher. So that was one factor. And another factor was the blood pressure. People with higher blood pressure were generally at more prone to the risk of heart disease. The next was the average risk of cholesterol, especially LDL cholesterol. So LDL cholesterol was measured to be the one of the main factors that can cause heart diseases. So they wanted to check the average risk of people between HDL and LDL cholesterol of men between 50 to 70. And they found that LDL cholesterol was much more uh, have a, a much more as a factor as a risk towards coronary heart disease next what are the types of potential bias there are three main biases that generally can happen selection bias information bias misclassification bias so selection bias is what are the how are, how are you selecting the participants into exposed and non-exposed groups so because based on some characteristics they can affect the outcome for example, let's say you have taken a person who is obese, but the person is healthy. That can cause a problem because you have put him in an exposed group and that can create a selection bias. 
let's say if the doctor thinks that the, that person is more prone to the disease then you can consider that okay that's the chance but if the person is healthy and he is put in an exposed group and can develop the disease then it's okay but if the person is not exposed to the factor but does not develop the disease that becomes that reduces the outcome of your chance outcome of your uh, result the next one is information bias because we contact collect different quality and extent of information from exposed and non-exposed groups the loss or to follow up differs between exposed and non-exposed groups and also between diseased and not diseased so because you are not able to have constant contact with them there is a chance that you might not have enough uh, you know enough chance of communicating with the people the next one is the misclassification bias so misclassification is how do you differentiate exposure status or disease status so for example if a person is obese and you classify him to be in the status that he has the disease then that's a problem on the same way if you take a healthy person who hasn't been exposed to any factor and you misclassify him as exposed that can also result affect your outcome so these are the types of potential bias in cohort studies so when do you warrant a cohort study when the exposure is known and when the exposure is rare and the incidence of the disease among the exposed is high so when the time between exposure and the disease is relatively short and when adequate funding is available so when the investigator and also has a long life expectancy so one of the best example of thinking about a cohort study is the present coronavirus studies this would be a perfect study for understanding cohort study would be a perfect study for understanding the coronavirus so most of the studies that are being done right now are cohort studies because one we know that the exposure factor is a certain person person to person contact or proximal contact next we know that the exposure is rare and it can only happen when the person is too close or when there is touch between bodily fluids and there is another factor called fomites fomites are common surfaces touched so when you touch common surfaces there is a chance of transferring the disease next when we know that the exposure and disease relativity is short so this is relatively short in comparison to long term diseases like cardiovascular disease or lung cancer these are long term diseases but when you consider that the exposure between the exposure and the disease the time is relatively short for the coronavirus we can consider that that to be an example of cohort study the next one is we know that adequate funding is needed so for pandemics it's easy to obtain funding because everybody wants to find a cure and everybody wants to how to stop it so this is an this is the cases where we might warrant a cohort study so these are some review questions so you can go through them and try to answer them based on the lecture what we have completed till date